before you do your reading today, I was wondering, could you give aspiring writers a piece of advice? Yes, I could. Um, <laughs> what would be the know, dentist spot advice? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to be good advice, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll give some advice if, if advice is asked for. Yes, for sure. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with novice writers. Um, you know, I, I, I teach in the, the, the creative writing program at U of T and at Humber College. Uh, and I've been doing this for 13 or 14 years. And, um, um, you know, as well as, as encountering or meeting great new writers, um, I also see uh, a lot of the sort of like the novice mistakes that writers make. And I'm sure I made when I was starting out and really, one of the one of the most frequent ones is, well, yeah, okay, we can talk about. I don't know how how much time we have, Crystal. We can talk about the show don't tell thing, right? Um, the show don't tell thing is the worst advice that any writer has ever received from anyone else. I mean, mm -hmm. the show don't tell thing has has hobbled so many so many novice writers, you know. Um, that um you know it's it, it's it's really it's really terrible you know it's like we are storytellers we tell stories right it so so the first the first order of business is show and tell okay yeah that you, you have to tell you know it was a dark and stormy night that is telling right okay you don't have to you don't have to take your character out into the forest and you know show them getting rained on right you know, the, story, <laughs> the narrative voice says it was a dark and stormy night there there we go yeah. Or, or 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 Joe loved Susie and Susie hated Joe. That's telling, and you're allowed to do that. And you should. Yeah. Do you don't have to take them into the bar and and have Susie <laughs> crack Joe over the head to show it, right? So, so, so you know you can do things uh, much more eloquently and much more concisely and convincingly uh, very often with with some with some some good telling. Um, the second bit of advice is maybe um, is is. Um, you know, beware the lazy narrator. Uh, lazy narrators um, just sort of observe the obvious. You know, if I'm describing, you know, what I see on your screen or on my screen, I would say, you know, you have this color hair and that color sweater, and there's a green creeping ivy behind you and a white belt <laughs> and so on. And these are all obvious and easily, you know, noticed, but they're not really revealing or interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, don't rely on a, a lazy narrator who just sort of points out, you know, the plainly obvious and un uninteresting, um, you know, an, an active narrator will notice a little bit about the, the, the physical world around their people and so on. But, but really what's interesting um, is, is, is the emotional and psychological detail that, that, that is happening in a scene or, you know, you know, that is observed through the point of view of your narrator. So um, yeah, so avoid the lazy narrator. You know, don't fill space with, with green plants and blonde hair and, and dark sweaters. <laughs> that's just like that's not revealing or it's not interesting at all. Um, you know, the, the emotional and the psychological texture of the scene is is very very much more interesting. How's oh that? God, now I'm gonna go back to my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's nothing obvious about your about your. <laughs> So, um, Dennis, you're going to read from us today, and before you do, can you share why you've chosen this particular excerpt to read? Yeah, well, um, through no, no one's fault but my own, I'm, I'm supremely unprepared right now. Um, you let me know weeks ago that you would ask me to read, and I totally forgot. So when you mentioned it just before we started taping, I oh, God, I, I have no idea what I should read. Um, uh, I will... <laughs> I will read part of the, I'll keep it short, um, yes. but I'll read part of the first person narrative. You know, William is our speaker and he's, he's reporting to us from 1960. Um, and he's, 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 he's inviting us into the world where he begins to, he recounts the beginning of, you know, when he began to understand that, that you know, his family was different uh, and they were, um, you know, they were not, um, they were not really welcome in town, uh, and it, and the reason is is kind of just slowly dawning on him. Uh, yeah, so this is 1960. This is um, fascism rules in Europe. Um, everybody in his town hates anything German, and he is of German heritage. 
Perhaps the one sign that puzzled me most in those early days was not the number painted on our front door, mistaken at that early age for our home address, added to the more recognizable street number 115 tacked onto the front porch, but the nervousness that plagued our father when he was in public. At home, he was calm and happy, or at least he seemed that way to me, the sort of father who pulled a coin from your ear on your birthday or, or, or played Herb Alpert songs on his tr old dented trumpet. But in the street, he was always on guard. Come on now, William, get a move on, he'd say, throwing a glance over his shoulder. He didn't associate with men from the shipyard as far as I can remember. And I have no recollection, uh, recollection of visitors calling at our house when I was a boy. At the annual company picnic, he never played pick up baseball or talked with the men in the beer tent where so many other fathers seemed to collect. He sat with us instead. And once after I made the mistake of speaking the wrong language, meaning German, he raised a finger to his lips and reminded me that outside the home, we were to speak only English. At the end of the day, as we settled, he and his brother, as we settled into our beds after one such picnic, Thomas told me it was the war that dictated the use of the languages we spoke and where we were allowed to speak them. Everything was about the war, he said, even the number painted on our front door. Everyone hated us the same way you hated the monster in a monster movie. I'd see for myself soon enough when school started that fall. I remembered no war, only stories that told of our father's regret at not, not having served. It seemed far-fetched that something that had happened outside the span of my own life could hold such sway over our town and family. Thomas reached for the flashlight at his bedside and pressed it to the underside of his chin. It's the Cold War now, stupid. That's what they call it, he said. The term Cold War was new to me. Icebergs and snow swept plains and howling winds came to mind. So you'd better get used to not having any friends at all. We watched, we watched films at school. You'll see them too. They blame us for everything. Us, I said, the Germans. What happens in the films? He scanned the ceiling with the flashlight beam. We'd strung half a dozen model airplanes up there on the fishing line in a perpetual dogfight that moved only slightly when a breeze came through the window. Nothing goes right anyway, he said. The beam traced across the ceiling in a cool, steady arc. He knew all there was to know. There could be, there could be no reason to doubt what he told me, though no sense could be made of, of it in my trusting heart. I looked up to him in every way a little brother could. He was taller and stronger and smarter than I could ever hope to be. And when he told me I'd never have friends in my life, I believed him as you believe the crystal ball that speaks the truth to you about your deepest and most shameful secret. He'd already learned something at school called duck and cover and knew the location of all the fallout shelters in town. And that in the early days following the war, they'd been, uh, they'd been known as sanctuaries and not shelters. The name made people feel better, he said. It made them feel safer. He even claimed to know by the lights in the sky over Hamilton what, what, what grade of steel, steel they were baking in the Stelco fire pits. I'll stop there. Thank you. No, thank you. That was great. I appreciate you giving everyone a taste of um, your characters' voices. Yeah, okay. My pleasure. And uh, a big, big thank you for coming on the program today. I so enjoy talking with you, speaking with you, Dennis, and learning more about the stories behind your book. Yeah, my pleasure. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what I'll do is I'll put links down below in the description book. So anyone who's watching right now can go um, and purchase a copy of The Good German or your other books. Yeah. And yeah, so and um, yeah, so that's that's what I'll do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Listen, Crystal, it's been a it's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your interest in my book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Bye. <laughs>